I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is a support group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, the Army's premier research repository on the history of the U.S. Army and its soldiers. Tonight's program is supported through the generous contributions of Members First Federal Credit Union of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Tonight, we're moving back to the War of 1812. I think last time we were up in the, the 20, 20th century, we're, we're moving back about 150 years. Uh, and tonight, I'm very pleased to host Colonel Retired David Fitz Enns, who was a regular Army officer for 30 years. During his two years in Vietnam, he received Soldier's Medal for Heroism, the Bronze Star for Valor, with four Oak Leaf Clusters and the Air Medal. As battalion and brigade commander, his signal command provided three presidents with the Moscow Hotline. He wrote his memoir for Random House, Why a Soldier, and five other books, which he received the Distinguished Book Board Prize from the Army Historical Foundation and the Military Order of St. Louis from Knights Templar for the book, The Final Invasion, which is topic tonight. Colonel Enns, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Mike. The Battle of Plattsburgh occurred on the 11th of September, 1814 at exactly eight o'clock in the morning, the same time that the attack occurred on New York and Washington, DC, 187 years later. It's a most complex battle. Winston Churchill wrote in the history of the English speaking peoples that it was the most decisive battle in the War of 1812. I'm going to try to do this battle at about 40 minutes. I've never done it that fast before, so this is gonna be History on horseback, uh, please stick with me. And at the end, I'm sure we'll have time for, for questions. So to get started off, the most important thing is most people don't know where Lake Champlain is. And let me just point out to you where we are. And later on, we'll do why, how, and when. This is Lake Champlain, this blue area on the, my homemade chart. The Canadian border in the north, it is 40 miles on the north end of the lake to Montreal. The lake is 100 miles long, and it ends at the headwaters of the Hudson River. There's a ford there, and it was used previously because this is the old American road to war. We're, this was fought in the uh, 1750s in the French and Indian War, Rogers Rangers. Uh, was here. Uh, the last the Mohican novel was written about this area. The lake is uh, 400 feet deep and it's 30 miles wide at its widest point, which is just below Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh is only 20 miles from the Canadian border, making it 60 miles from the St. Lawrence River. On the border is the town of Rouser's Point. The only road and the quartermaster general at the time said this road was nearly impassable, runs through the woods. This is really wilderness country in 1814 and 20 miles through Shazy, a tiny little village, farming village, through Beekman Town, another farming village that has a road that cuts off to the lake. And then another five miles later into the town of Plattsburgh, which only has a thousand inhabitants at the time. So we're talking about a few hundred buildings. Here is the Saranac River running that empties the uh, mountains uh, near Whiteface, if you've ever been a skier. Uh, and it's a very rapid river. In fact, it was used for logging. So it's almost impassable. There are two bridges in Plattsburgh. One's called naturally the Bridge Street Bridge and the other one didn't have a name at the time. And that's a mile here on the far side between that bridge and the other bridge here. So that gives you some idea of the terrain because this is going to be both a land and a lake battle. It's going to be very carefully coordinated. And I guess the next question is, why would anyone want to fight a major battle here? Now we all know that the battles of fought in the uh, War of 1812, Baltimore, Washington, DC, the burning of the Capitol, Later on, uh, the uh, Southern battles at the Mississippi head, and hardly anyone knows about the Battle of Plattsburgh. And there's a very good reason for that, and we'll get into it. But they all occur at general, well, 
the Battle of Baltimore and Washington occur at the same time as the Battle of Plattsburgh. So that's where we are. We're in northern New York. The other side of the lake is Burlington over here, the only real town at the time. At the southern end of the lake is where the ships are made, the American ships are made. And at the northern end of the lake, just here, 10 miles inside uh, Canada, is where the Canadian Marine, or the Royal Navy, if you want to give it a title, made their ships. So all the ships, because the, sh the lake is landlocked, the sh all the ships that we'll talk about are made on the lake, and they're all made of pine. So that's where. Now the question is why? Well, it all starts with Thomas Jefferson, believe it or not. Thomas Jefferson said, and it was reported in newspapers in uh, Montreal and in London, he wrote, the taking of Canada this year is a mere matter of marching. This is explosive. And the reason he said that was because once upon a time, he was ambassador to Paris. In fact, he was there during the French Revolution. And he saw the spirit of the French people during the French Revolution. He never forgot it. And of course, he was a revolutionary himself, obviously. And he had a feeling that the people who lived in Canada in 1812 didn't want to be British subjects. He thought they were ready for revolution, and he was just the kind of guy who could give them a revolution. Therefore, he didn't need a great big army and a navy. All he had to do, as he said, when an American militiaman puts one foot across the border, the French, which were 80% of the people in the, at the time in that part of uh, Western Canada, will naturally revolt, and the outcome will be good for the United States and bad for England that uh, perhaps uh, it'll be a sovereign nation we can trade with, or even maybe we can amalgamate the two countries. Who knows what could happen in those early days because it was a time of revolution uh, in the world. And so this inflammatory talk really upset things uh, in England. But more, more importantly, people in the, United, in the United States believed it. And even though the militia, or I should say the regular army, is only a thousand people who are in active duty, and they're mostly in forts across the, uh, along the American coast, eastern coast, the militia numbers on the books thousands. But uh, they really are more of a national guard and a social society. Uh, they've been provided with arms. They're divided in two groups, one that's kind of a special group that they're getting a little bit of money for, and the other is just kind of an honorary group that comes and meets with them and uh, borrows weapons and so forth. And mostly they train one month out of the week, and uh, it turns into a big social operation. But the American people, and Jefferson in particular, and Madison, who's president at this time, also believe, really, that the American Revolution was won by uh, the militia by American forces, and they really don't credit France for all of the things that it did for America that turned the Revolutionary War in their favor. And they really believe that uh, if we declare war um, uh, and try to take Canada, uh, that uh, it's a few militiamen and a little bit of money uh, will work. And the other reason, though, that they do this is, is Jefferson's not all that out of line, uh, is because of what's going on in Europe. Now, Napoleon, obviously, has been fighting in Europe since uh, 1797 plus. Uh, this, we're now in 1812. Uh, he's about to invade um, Russia. He has uh, taken over uh, various uh, and almost all countries in Europe. Uh, Britain has uh, bankrolled uh, all of those armies, Russia, uh, uh, um, Prussia, Spain, uh, and so they've got a huge investment. And they also are invested in troops because they've sent uh, their, quote, army uh, under various commanders. The last will be Wellington, of course, uh, into Spain. And they fought and they took Spain. Uh, and in 1812, uh, uh, things have got England, quote, decisively engaged. And we all know in a military term, that is that when you've got somebody by the nose and they've got you, 
you're decisively engaged and you're not able to do a lot of things on the outside. And of course, the, the British Navy, the biggest Navy in the world, uh, and the most successful Navy in the world is also heavily involved in the blockade of, of France so that Napoleon can't get his supplies. And he's been using American uh, merchantmen to supply him, uh, uh, supply England all this time. And so everything is in England's favor to stay in Europe. And therefore, they can't come and help the Canadians if Washington were to invade. Now, if they, if the British have helped him, have helped uh, General Preval, the Lieutenant General, who was the Governor General of Canada at the time, uh, and they have sent about 4,000 British troops. And so there, and that plus the uh, indigenous uh, troops that he had, as the militia and so forth, uh, he had been able to defend himself uh, at this, uh, this, this time. So, what is, what is the first move that our friend General, uh, President Jefferson has talked President Madison into? Well, uh, with the help of uh, General Dearborn, uh, who is the commanding general of the American army at this time, such as it is, and the militia, uh, he has come up with a plan. He wrote the plan in the late winter, early spring of 1812, knowing that uh, Jefferson and Madison were inclined to declare war on England. And so the plan is very complex, particularly for one, the forces, and two, the time, and three, the terrain, because the terrain is wilderness. And he's planning on four attacks when war is declared, which it will be uh, at the end of uh, June in 1812. And the four attacks are Detroit, the Niagara, basically Queenstown, Kingston, which is on the St. Lawrence River, uh, where uh, the lake enters at the river, and Montreal, of course, the capital. Those are the four. And he wants to call, bring these off on time together. Well, that's absolutely impossible. And you can imagine what's going to happen. They all fail. One, two, three at Kingston never does take place. And one at Plattsburgh. So Plattsburgh had been in this before. They are able to cross the border with a large military force and get about a mile and a half before they run into hardly any resistance at all, but it spooks them and they run back across the border and that's the end of it in 1812. In 1813, we do it again. Not this time in Detroit, uh, but we're mostly in the Niagara. And that's where this whole war really is, is, is centered is in the Niagara area, Queenstown and specifically. And at that time, we fight major battles and we continue to fight this through 18 and 1814. And again, in 1814, we, we uh, attack across good old Blacksburg border at Rousers Point. And we get about two miles and this time, we run into a blockhouse, everybody freaks out. The Americans shoot at each other, turn around and come back. That's the spring of, of 1814. So that's the involvement of the Americans to this point. Now what's left behind is in the United States is the remnant of that force at Plattsburgh that was going to attack. And now we're regrouping and seeing what's going to happen now that it's 1814, the spring is on, but something very bad has happened as far as the Jefferson is concerned because things aren't going so well for Napoleon. Uh, as we all know, he lost badly uh, in Russia, and uh, he has continued to lose across the continent and has been backed up into Paris and lost. Uh, uh, Wellington has beaten him in Spain. Uh, things are definitely uh, going contrary to, to their plan. And so now where are we in 1814 in the spring? Well, we said, why did the Americans do it? Now we're going to tell you why, why the British are suddenly interested in doing this. Lord Bathurst, who was the colonial secretary in England, and a very good friend of Wellington, by the way, because he bought his house. Okay? Uh, he wants Wellington to take the remnant of the British army that's virtually drinking its way across France at this point because Napoleon is gone uh, and uh, everyone is consolidating in that area. And with the ogre gone, 
it's going to be very difficult to maintain the British forces because uh, we know when our Gulf War and other wars end, the first thing we do is we draw back the army as low as possible to let standing armies are are expensive and standing navies are expensive as well. At this point, Bathurst tries to talk Wellington into taking his forces that are drinking their way across France. And instead of bringing them home uh, victorious, which is, by the way, is what they want to do and what they expect to do with this great, great victory, instead, he wants to put them all on board ships and send them to solve, as he says, says solve the North American problem. That's the War of 1812. By the way, the British call it the American War. So in order to do that, he requires a tremendous military operation when you think of it. Now, they're not planning to take the United States. What they're planning to do is solidify the Canadian border so we stop attacking them. I and mean, we've been doing it for three years. They're unsuccessfully, but it's costing them a lot costing both sides a lot. As a result, here's the plan. The plan is that Vice Admiral Cockburn will form a force in Bermuda, and he will take that force and break it up into three major activities. One will go to reinforce Prevost, and he sends Prevost a secret order in that spring telling him this plan that I'm going to outline for you. So Prevost knows all about what's going to happen. Now, Prevost is an experienced general officer. He was, he was a major general. He fought in the Caribbean in several major battles. He's very well thought of. He's a very, very good administrator. He's also a French speaker, a native French speaker as well. He's very popular in Canada, uh, and he has put together a very good force. This guy knows what he's doing. So... Cockburn is going to give him 10,000 of Wellington's troops and send them to Montreal. He's going to take a large naval force, he's going to take a naval force and send it along the eastern seaboard of the United States from Maine on down to the edge of the Chesapeake. And these individual men of war, mostly uh, uh, third liners or uh, frigates, will go into American harbors and disrupt, uh, shoot up the place, burn down the warehouses, cause mayhem. Uh, General Sherbrooke, who's in Maine, is going to take a small portion of that force and actually invade Maine. Now, Maine is not a state, but it's under the protection of Massachusetts. So Massachusetts militia is supposed to go and protect Maine, but they're not able to do that. So Sherbrooke is successful as he walk, works his way down through the wilderness, absolute wilderness in Maine towards Portland and so forth. So there is another land attack going on. It's, it's, it's a diversionary attack. And in fact, all of this is diversionary attack other than revolt. Then Admiral Cotton Byrne, I always mix the two of them up, two, two star admiral. Uh, is going to take a large fleet with about 7,000 total troops, that's include Navy and Army, on board and go into the Chesapeake. And he's going to send small boats up uh, uh, towards Washington, D.C. on the Potomac River, but the majority of the force is going to work its way up the Chesapeake and then invest Baltimore, because Baltimore is where all these raiders, these naval raiders have come from that have been attacking uh, and so he's going to put that force in there to harass, and he's going to land troops there, and the ge commanding general comes up with the idea, let's try to take Washington, D.C., because things are not very well protected here by General Winder, uh, who's not doing a good job in Baltimore at all with his militia and so forth. Uh, and then thirdly, another force is going to go all the way around uh, to the Mississippi, the mouth of the Mississippi River, and attack New Orleans there, which, of course, Jackson will defend. And that's, that's the third battle. But that takes place later, towards in, in November and December. So that's, that's the plan. And Prevost likes the plan. He thinks the plan will work. And his orders are, one, protect the border. Two, take whatever you can of the United States territory, 
because when things break down, remember the peace talks are on again. They were off, they were in Russia. Now they're on again in Ghent, Belgium. So there's negotiations going on here at the same time. And so he's, he's counting on whatever Prevost can take. That's where they're gonna draw the line. And they wanna lop off Maine, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Northern New York, and they'd like to secure the southern edge of Lake Erie and right across to the Michigan and whatever else they can get, wherever they can draw that line at, at, at Ghent. But it'll be based on where Prevost is. So that's, that's what's the why of what's going on. Now, how are they going to do it? That's, that's another question. The Americans uh, under General Izzard is, is still in place all that, uh, that uh, uh, spring of 1812. And with the help of uh, Major Derussi and uh, uh, Lieutenant Derussi and Major Totten, who are engineers, as you should know, Fort Totten is in New York City and, and Fort Derussi is in Hawaii on the beach, right? Named for those two engineers. With their help and General uh, Izard's troops, 6,000 of them, they dig in large emplacements on. Here's Plattsburgh. There's the two bridges. They're going to attack from the north. The Navy is going to come down from the north. He is going to invest this portion between the two bridges, build forts here and here and here, and dig in. Just like World War I, it'll look like World War I trenches that go for about a mile. It's about a mile between these two places right here. And he's going to dig in the, his forces here. And he's going to fight them. Now, he's got 6,000 good troops. And he's, he's really prepared for it. In addition to that, he's got the New York militia, which is uh, 2,500 New York militia that are committed. And the guy who commands that is, is uh, Benjamin Moore. And he lives in Plattsburgh. In fact, he lives in the middle of where they're digging all this stuff in. So as a result, we're not in that bad of shape because what's going to end up with is, is the Prevost is going to bring uh, a little more than probably 12,000 troops. And we're talking about uh, 8,000 plus the militia here. But things don't go that way. Instead, the Secretary of War, a guy named Armstrong, who fought in the Revolutionary War as a lieutenant, he has decided that, in fact, Prevost is going to take all those troops and he's going to go to Niagara. And they're going to continue to fight at Niagara. Now, that's not an unreasonable point because that's where they have been fighting. So Prevost, knowing this, he sends a small portion of the 15,000, one small brigade west with a big hoopla and puts it all in the newspapers and convinces a spy uh, American spy was a lawyer that works for Armstrong, that that's where Prevost is going to attack. He's going to Niagara, and he orders Izzard to get out. And he sends Izzard and his whole complement west. And he gets he sends those orders uh, on the uh, 26th of September. Now, I'm sorry, of August, of August, 26th of August. And Izzard, his spies tell him that that's not what's happening at all. In fact, the British are building a huge ship on the lake. They're going to come down on the naval side. They're also going to come down with this, the majority of this army, and they're going to wipe them out. And so he sends all kinds of uh, messages down south to Washington, D.C. But in Washington, they are engaged in other things. They see what's coming. They know about these raids. They're seeing what's happening in the Chesapeake. And they are not inclined to support him whatsoever. And in fact, they order him to go to Niagara. Even though he fights it and fights it on the 1st of, by the, by the 1st of September, the night before the 1st, Izzard picks up his army and he leaves. He walks out, he goes south to the Mohawk River, uh, which is down toward uh, about uh, 80 miles south, and goes up the Mohawk, the Sackets Harbor, and, and going to put his troops on ships and send them to the Niagara. This leaves behind at Plattsburgh Brigadier General McComb, brand new Brigadier General Artillery. Uh, and 
what's left of prisoners in the stockade and the hospital because they've got late fever, which is traditional at this particular place, and they have a lot of sick, lame, and lazy left behind. And Macomb is going to end up with remnants, sick remnants of these various regiments to defend uh, uh, what's ha going to happen at Plattsburgh. So, like I said, this is history on horseback, and I'm throwing out all kinds of things to try to get to, to the battle. Now, as far as the Navy is concerned, the United States, uh, under Lieutenant McDonough, who's 28 years old, has put together a fleet of the Saratoga, which he has built, the Ticonderoga, uh, uh, the Pribble, uh, and the Eagle. These are small ships. They're all under 100 feet, and most of them are more on the 60-foot size. Uh, they're armed, but they're not armed with long-range cannons because that's not the kind of fighting they do on the lake. They're always looking for smugglers. They have carronades or culembrades, which are naval cannons that are built on slides, not rolling uh, into the sides in front of the ships. They shoot very large ball. They're very destructive, and their range is 500 yards. Now, in Canada, they are building a frigate. She's called the Confiance. Uh, and she's huge. Uh, she's 120 feet. She, it, it, and that combined with two ships they've already captured from the Americans and renamed, uh, and one other ship that they've always had, the Eagle, which is 70 feet long uh, and has got a, a dozen cannons on it. Uh, but the, the Canadians are more uh, built for naval warfare, and they've got, on board the Confiance, they've got 30 guns, the majority of which are seven foot six inch uh, uh, cannons uh, that are the finest and the newest technology to come out of England. They fire a 36 pound ball and they fire a mile and a half, not 500 yards. So you can see the difference is enormous. You can think of the naval battle, the naval uh, elements as being Americans are one third to a half of what uh, they're facing. So we've got this huge army of 15,000 coming south and the Navy, only good thing about it is Confiance is not finished. She's still being built. She was put down in June. She's not supposed to be ready to, to uh, move out until the end of September. And here it is, the, the uh, beginning of September. And she has got carpenters on board. She even has uh, in her trials, she has the ammunition uh, not because there's no magazine on board the ship, is all in boats like sausages strung out behind as she tries to maneuver because she hasn't got sailors. She's got the 39th Infantry Regiment and a bunch of Marine gunners and the brand new commanding officer who got there the day the ship was launched. So they're not in such good shape either. So their plan is to come down the lake and they're coordinating with Prevost, with runners going back and forth through this wilderness. As Prevost gets to Rouser's Point, there, on the first, because Izard left the day before. He knows what's here, and it isn't much. So he's going to move down and start down this torturous road. And it's going to take him six days to get past Shay-Z down here to Beekman Town. This column is something to see. They had to rent from the farmers wagons in order to carry their supplies. Uh, they, they've taken the horses away from the 19th Dragoons uh, and the, they're walking, you know how unhappy a Dragoon is with high boots and a great big saber walking this 20 miles down here. And their horses are being used to pull wagons uh, because they need something to take the heavy artillery, they've got siege artillery, the great big mortars uh, on wagons, on slides, they're not on wheels, they're dragging them down. There's six batteries or artilleries of six field guns each, plenty of artillery. And they also have a rocket battery with them. You can imagine these are the same rockets that are gonna see, be seen in Baltimore, only they're gonna be seen in Plattsburgh beforehand. First rockets, red glare will be at Plattsburgh. So you've got a battery of rocket troops as well. You've also got the women and children that support these regiments because they have no trains. Uh, the British Army didn't have trains at that time and they used settlers 
and families, and one out of every 10 wife is allowed to bring her children along with her, and they take care of all of the things the quartermaster and the medical corps and all that would do for the soldiers. So this is an enormous column that's, that's uh, coming down. Now, on the American side, uh, uh, General McComb knows what's happening because he's got scouts out there, and he gets the, the Navy who planned to fight in the lake against the, the Canadian Marine, against the Confiance and her sister ships, and the 12 uh, gunboats that are with her, that are rowed, uh, that are going to come down the lake. And McComb says, no, come into the bay and, and moor in a line across my right flank, right here. And that's if you can see the four dots that are put here. And they're hooked up to an island called Crab Island here. So they're anchored on an island and they go out into the lake. Now this, this bay, this Cumberland Bay, is about 10 miles this way and 10 miles that way. So it's a pretty good sized bay. And it, it is excluded from the lake by a peninsula, Cumberland Head, that sticks out into the lake. And the Canadian Marine is gonna come down here and they're going to run into the Americans, not in the lake as they planned because Confiance could take care of them completely. Instead, they're gonna find the Americans in the middle of the bay. And so that's what's the situation is, is Canadians are up here, the Navy, they're having trouble going south. They're getting their, uh, their dozen gunboats together. They got their three other ships to lend in the lead because she's been down here before. The Army has crossed and is coming down this way. The American forces are dug in around here, about 1,500 of them. And Macomb sends up this road here at Beekman Town, the New York militia, 2,500. Well, not quite. The militia doesn't show. Instead, 700 militia show. These are paid troops. Only 700 of them show up. And Macomb sends them up here, not so much to blunt, but just to see what the heck is coming down this road. And that's where they are, right there. They send out scouts on horseback, two lieutenants, and they track the British as they're coming down. And they send reports all the way to Macomb, so he really knows what's going on, what's coming down here. The... Two lieutenants come back, they pick up an entire troop of, of dragoon, militia dragoons now, American, and to go up to blunt this off on the, on the 5th. Well, they don't have much luck and they run back. And when they run back, they run right through the 700 militia. You ever seen cavalry with all that clanking and cracking and so forth? They go, and unfortunately, guess how they're dressed? They're wearing British uniforms because they're militia that go clear back to the Revolutionary War and they're wearing red coats, even though they're American militia. They never switch to blue. As a result, the 700 militia decide that they're being attacked by British cavalry and they leave. And I have a message right from General Moore to the governor of New York that says they will endure internal enmity upon themselves because they forced deserted the cause and leaves him actually standing in the middle of the road, waving his saber, yelling, come back, come back, okay? It's like a cartoon, but it's real. In addition to the militia that was sent up the road, uh, a major named John Wool, who was at Queenstown and was wounded at Queenstown and was captured, he, he commands a regiment of uh, the forces that belong to Macomb. What's left of them? He only has 200 left, and they're not in very good shape. Macomb's, uh, he, he asked Macomb to send him up the road and blunt this. And so a little further down, the American regular army finally made contact with the 3rd Regiment of infantry, the Buffs from England, a very famous regiment. And they fight it out there, and their commanding officer is killed. Uh, Colonel Willington is killed along with several other officers. And of course, the, the, the account says that the British didn't even come out of formation. And they, they didn't even drop their packs. They attacked right away into this small force of 200 with the point 
uh, the third buffs, and for the next uh, days between the sixth and the ninth, they will they will uh, wool will fight a delaying action all the way through the town of Plattsburgh, and he will cross that bridge. And as he does, he'll pull up the planks, take his artillery across, pull up the, he has two guns, pull up the planks, and now all the American forces are here. A handful of militia has stayed, and I mean a handful. So he's got 1,500 or so American troops of various kinds, and here we've got about 12,000 uh, that have come down, and they will now occupy the city on the 8th and 9th. And there are three brigades. One of them is commanded by Brisbane, and he takes this road and goes over to the edge of the lake, and he comes down the edge of the lake. The other two brigades under Manly Powers and General Robinson will come into town and they will set up in the city. They find out that there is a ford up here, up the river, about three miles. So the plan is that the British, that is two brigades, Robinson and Manly Powers, will cross here, avoid the bridges, come around. This is all wilderness, very hard to, to work through, and come around and attack Macomb from the rear while Brisbane tries to cross these bridges and attack here. And uh, that is the, the plan. The naval force here has been brought in close to shore so it can support with naval gunfire from these four ships. So it is going to be a coordinated attack of defense. Uh, and you, we are yet to see the Navy come down the lake. They're late. And the reason they're late is because the ship is a disaster and nothing works on it. The guy who's running it, uh, Downey, who's very, very competent, has never been on the lake before. Uh, the lake is uh, rather tricky. Uh, and most importantly, the winds are the, from the wrong direction. The winds are from the south and confines, confiance, is square rigged. And she's square rigged and you know that a square rigger does not go into the wind. And so she can't move. She wants to get out of there in the night, cannot do it. And even though Macomb or uh, Prevost is ready to fight, he can't because he doesn't have his naval force. And he sends him a message. He says, well, where are you? Where, when are you going to come? And he finally gets a message back and says, I'll be there on the 10th. I think the winds are going to change. And uh, so Macomb, uh, Prevost writes back and says to him, scale your guns when you come, and then I'll kick off the, the combined attack on the lake and on the land. And that's what they're waiting for on the 10th when all of this takes place. Well, things don't go so well. Not for the British, thank God. In the meantime, Macomb has asked Vermont for their militia. And Sam Strong, their commanding general, says, yes, we're going to come across on a ship called the president. And the governor says, no, you weren't. I'm, general, I'm Governor Chittenden, and you guys are staying in Vermont. You fight, you are under my direction, and you can't go. So they're not coming. So he's not going to get the people over here. Well, fortunately for Macomb, on the morning of the 10th, very, very early morning on the 10th, Strong ignores his orders, and he ferries these troops, 2,500 across, but he only got one ship to do it. And so it's gonna take him time. And Macomb then sends him a message and says, come up here and support my left flank, that ford that's there, because he knows that's the only other place that the British can cross right there. And so Strong is gonna come across and he's gonna fill his troops in here as they come and Powers and Robinson are gonna come and attack. Well. Finally, Downey gets his stuff together. He's got four ships, Confiance, huge, monstrous, and they come down the lake with their road galleys. The Americans have put together 12 road galleys as well. These are 60 feet long, got a cannon in the front. Some of them have also have a Karen brain in the back, a smaller cannon. And they're going to be in and around the Americans to try to keep their, the, uh, Canadian road galleys from getting in close to the American fleet and, and holding them out, right? Pull the, the um, uh, 
galley up against the American ship and fire the cannon and put a big hole in it and sink it. That's the, what they're supposed to do. And the American rogue galleys are going to, going to fight it out and keep them away. So there's two naval battles going on at the same place here in Cumberland Bay. So here we are, the morning uh, of the 11th. They finally come down the lake. They get here to Cumberland Head. They scale their guns and they put the whole group together and they begin to come around to attack the Americans. The British move their forces off here to head for the Ford. They get lost. They have a quartermaster officer directing them and he can't quite figure out where to go. And he takes them the wrong direction about six miles and really takes them out of the battle, thank God. And they never really get into here until much, much later in the uh, late morning, early afternoon. So they're kind of out of, out of the way. And so you know, all I have is Brisbane and one brigade in here, but that's plenty to take the, the Americans if they can cross these bridges. And when Brisbane starts firing here in the city, uh, the American fleet has to slide out because they're under the field guns of the British. And so they slide out a ways out of the range of the guns. As a result, the battle separates and it is no longer a coordinated attack. The American forces are going to fight the Canadian Navy and the land forces are going to fight the British Army and neither can support each other with firepower or troops in any other way. We end up with two separate battles. So down they come, they're here on Cumberland Head, they get themselves together and they come around the tip and they, I'm told, are something to see. Four ships in line, Linnet, Confiance, and two American ships that have been captured and renamed the Finch and the Chuck. And they come around and their plan is to stay away from the American because they know the Americans can only shoot 500 yards and they can fire a mile and a half. Okay? So all I have to do is come in here in a racetrack pattern like that, go around and around and fire as they go by, as the, the, uh, the guns level on the enemy and keep doing that. The Americans can't hit them and they're gonna destroy this, turn them into toothpicks. And they certainly can because they've got the power to do it. But something goes wrong. The winds that changed that came down from the north now that drove the fleet down. When you get into Cumberland Bay, the winds change. And instead of the winds coming this way, the winds come this way. And as square rigged ships of the British and Royal Canadian Air Force, uh, Navy can't go forward. They lose their ability to maneuver, which is death in the days of sail. And instead of going along and staying outside the range of the American guns, Confiance and Linnet and all the, and the other two drifts right straight into the American guns. Now, the British have still got more than a third heavier lifting uh, guns that can, can blast them out of the water, but the Americans and their Cullen brain, their other guns are short, but they're called the smashers. And they're actually invented by the English. Uh, and they're, they're short, they're fat, they, get, they fire big, big projectiles, some of them 36 pounds, and, uh, and the British drift directly into the line of the Americans. And it becomes a slugfest. Now, I went to England. I, I do most of my research on the enemy side because the Americans sometimes don't always tell the truth. And so I did an awful lot of research there and I went to see uh, um, a Navy uh, artillery you know, commanding officer at the, at the artillery school who was retired who had a Congreed gun. And he took it out on the uh, pitch and he fired it for me. And one round from this 36 pound cannon filled the entire pitch with smoke. You couldn't see a thing. There's a hundred, there's over a hundred guns firing out here at the same time within a circle of about 300, 400 yards. Nobody can see anything. 
The noise is tremendous. They disorient the troops. Some of these guns are loaded three and four times, they find, after the battle. Nobody put powder in them. Okay? The troops are totally disoriented. It is an absolute slugfest out there. And one ship after another is just is turned into splinters. But in, within the first eight minutes of the battle, the American commander, McDonough, fires a long gun. It's, he only has two cannons that shoot more than 50 yards. And he hits the muzzle of the Congre of the Congreve gun that's on board the ship that Downey, the commanding officer, is sighting. Downey is behind it like this, and the round comes through, strikes the muzzle of the cannon that he is sighting, rips it out of the slide, and Downey catches it in his arms, 2,000 pound barrel and it smashes Downey to the deck, crushes him. And they said, when they got the gun off of him, there was only one wound, a large red spot where his heart used to be, crushed it, killed him. They lose their commanding officer in the first eight minutes of the battle. And from then on, things go downhill. But there's one more trick. Both fleets are nearly destroyed. The, the, they're drifting around, they're going on shore, uh, but uh, the, the Saratoga with uh, uh, McDonough in command is still fighting, and he fires his last guns, and he did one thing that was unexpected. He had a copy of Nelson's book from the time that he fought three different battles where his, he fought a fleet that was anchored. He won two of them, Copenhagen and Alexandria, but he lost the third in Morocco. And so McDonough then took his advice and before the battle, he took rowboats out on each side with a small anchor and a long rope, a sp it's called a spring, the longest rope they have. And he attaches one, one of the strings to the, to the uh, prow of the ship, and runs it around to the stern. He takes the other one from the stern and he runs it around to the prow and drops them about 50 yards out. And so at this point, even though all his guns are fired on one side and Confiance is sitting right in front of him with a new commanding officer, a very junior lieutenant, and they're just, just firing and firing and firing at each other. Downey cuts one of these springs and he puts the other one on the capstan and he winds it around and Saratoga reverses position in place and all the guns on that side are loaded 10 guns and a lieutenant goes along and with his pistol he fires each one of these guns and blows confiance out of the water confiance strikes her colors and the naval battle is over now in the meantime these guys that went around here they meet strong and the and the Vermont militia, that they drive them five miles straight back. Manly Powers, he's got cannons with him. They hardly hesitate. They drive them straight back. And Robinson takes his brigade and comes around to the rear of Macomb with his brigade at the same moment that the naval battle is lost. And Prevost, who's sitting up here, sends a messenger around and says, retreat. And Robinson, being a good soldier, even though he's in view of the rear of the American lines, pulls back and goes back into town. And two days later, the British go back into Canada. And the sailors, soldiers from both sides are buried today in Riverside Cemetery right here in Plattsburgh, one of the few places where you'll find the two combatants buried together, to include Downey is buried in Plattsburgh. And that's the story of the Battle of Plattsburgh. Okay, we'll open it up for questions right now. If you do, please use the question and answer icon uh, to submit your question, and then I'll pass them over to Colonel Adams. Uh, question, since you raised the seminar, are the graves marked? Are the graves in the cemetery marked? Can you hear me? I, I can barely hear uh, you, Mike. Okay. Are the graves in the cemetery marked? Yes. 
the graves are marked. Uh, there was probably uh, about 60 or 70 of them, but only about a dozen survive today. And we hold a ceremony there every year on the uh, anniversary of the battle around the grave of uh, the British commander, which was established by his sister about 30 years later. And it's a sarcophagus that sits above ground. And then there are headstones around uh, and they're all marked. And we do a little ceremony every year uh, on the anniversary of the battle. So the battle was decisive because it prevented the uh, a redrawing of the borders between Canada and the U.S. Right. Yeah. It, it, let me tell. You, this is what the British plan. If they could, if they could be successful, if they had captured these ships, if they had defeated the army. They would then take their army and they would embark on these American ships. And they would then take their fighting fleet and the, and the transport, because they had no transport. And there are no roads that exist on either side of the lake. And they would go down past what today is Ticonderoga. You know, that old fort used to be carry on, built by the French. Today, it's still there, it's Ticonderoga. You go south of that to a town called Whitehall, and they would, they would winter at Whitehall in uh, New York, uh, 30 miles, 40 miles north of Albany. And then in the spring, they could do, they could reinforce, they would stay the winter. They could reinforce and they could continue on down if that was necessary. Or the people at Ghent would say, okay, our, our troops are right here in uh, northern New York. We'll draw a new border, you know, basically along, along the border of northern Massachusetts and draw it straight west. Uh, and they, what they wanted was those little New England states, um, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Northern New York. And if they could draw that border across uh, Northern New York, that would put Lake Erie within Canada. And maybe they could even negotiate to get the tips of the other lakes within Canada. Again, I've seen a map that they've drawn in England in their, in their uh, British Museum that shows Michigan is called uh, uh, Indian State. And then they have uh, the New England part is called uh, Columbia. They are going to rename this that area Columbia because they don't want it to become French. That's, that's the plan that I found in Parliament in England. Uh, that's, that's their intention. They don't want America. They just want to, to solidify that border. And if they're lucky, they could take a portion of it further on down, wherever Prevol ends up being. Uh, this question um, is about Jefferson. Why did Jefferson think the Canadians would have changed their minds about joining the colonies since 35 years ago during the American Revolution? They sort of rejected that idea. Well, remember the Canadians are split between French Canadians and British Canadians, Canadians who many of whom were patriots during the Revolutionary War and went to Canada and stayed there. But 80% of them are French. And as you know, today in Canada, the French uh, in Quebec are so militant, you know, they're still wanting to turn Canada into a French state. So he see, and his experience during the revolution in France, he sees how uh, uh, deeply ingrained fr the French spirit is uh, in France. And he believes the same spirit exists in Canada, and 80% over 20% can overturn the government uh, with the help of American forces. Question about uh, Maine and, and Vermont. Uh, one of the reasons they, they wanted those uh, two states during the American Revolution is because some of the taller trees in Maine, I think, provided the mass for many of their uh, their ships. Was that part of the Oh, reason? that's very oh, true. Pardon? No, no question about it. Now, Maine is, is important to them, and this is the time of wooden ships. And so those forests, those great forests in Maine and, and, uh, and the, that part of Canada are, are what they need for ships of the line, because their forests are running out in England, and they're buying uh, their, their uh, wood by this time uh, from uh, the Nordic countries. And they see uh, Maine as another source of, of oak and, and other hardwoods that they need. Remember, the ships that are on the lake that fight this battle are all pine, and they're all American pine. The smugglers, American smugglers in Vermont and New York, take the wood up 
and sell it to the Canadians and the Canadians turn it into ships and attack Americans. I mean, uh, the, the economy around Lake Champlain in 1812 is 60 miles from Montreal and 300 miles from New York City, right? So who are you gonna trade with? Yeah. So the smuggling is the industry in Northern New York in these days. Okay. Well, sir, that's, that's all the questions. Uh, I wanna thank you for, for joining us tonight. Do you have any closing comments? No, I, uh, I launched uh, my book. Uh, here it is. I launched the book on the 11th of September, 2001 in New York City. Not a good day to launch a book about the Battle of Plattsburgh or anything else. Nobody bought a copy for six months after the trauma of the attack on New York City. Well, here it is. And since then, it's won several awards. And in fact, on the back, you'll find the crest of the Army War College, which endorses this, this study of mine, which I'm very pleased to have. Uh, in addition to that, here's my latest book. Uh, this is The Spy on Putney Bridge. It's about World War I and German spies in London based on a true story. It took me five years to write this, particularly because of the pandemic. And uh, it's for sale. My website is uh, uh, historybythecolonel.com, all one word, historybythecolonel.com. And you'll see all six of my books. And this one in particular, The Spy on Putney Bridge, is brand new. Uh, and so far on uh, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and even Walmart, it's received uh, five-star comments. So if you want a, a good and new read uh, about a spy story, this is this is a dandy, the spy in Putney Bridge. Well, well sir, I'll I'll uh, put your website and the new books uh, up on the video when we were, we'll post the uh, video of this talk onto our YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you for tonight. I'd ask our audience uh, to please pass word about this lecture. Uh, let people know that uh, the recording will be up on YouTube in the next day or so. And then I would invite you to come back on the seventh of September. Again, 7 p.m. Easter, when we advance two centuries forward, uh, a little bit different. It's called SUVs Suck in Combat with Carrie Ch uh, Katschian. Uh, it looks at some of the, uh, the teams that did nation building in Iraq and how they were equipped or not well equipped uh, as they moved about the battlefield. So SUVs Suck in Combat, a rather unique title for a book. But again, should be an interesting talk on the 7th of September at 7 p.m. So, sir, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again. Good night, sir. Good night.